from the University of British Columbia, I'm Martin Ordonez, and this is Power Electronics. Hi, my name is Ali Saket, and I'm a Power Electronics Researcher at the University of British Columbia. My research is about developing new methods for designing efficient and compact magnetics for power converters. Today, I'm going to talk about inductors. To understand how inductors work, one easy way is to study them through magnetic equivalent circuit. Using this method, we build equivalent electric circuits for magnetic structures, and using circuit analysis rules, we find magnetic quantities. To do so, we have to introduce equivalent quantities in electric and magnetic domain. Let's start by electric field intensity shown with the letter E. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume that we have a uniform and constant electric field. As you remember from physics courses, this electric field induces voltage equal to E times L between two points that have the distance of L. Equivalent of E field in magnetic domain is H field, which is called magnetic field intensity. Similar to E, H induces a scalar potential called magnetomotive force or MMF between two points in the field. The MMF is shown with the letter F for a uniform and constant H. The induced MMF between two points with the distance of L is equal to H times L. Another quantity in electric domain is the current density, which is called J. For a uniform and constant J passing through a surface with the area of A, the total current I is equal to J times the surface area. Equivalent to J in magnetic domain is B, which is called magnetic flux density. For a uniform and constant B passing through a surface with the area of A, the total magnetic flux is equal B times A. Again, we remember from our physics class that E and J are related to each other through the material conductivity. In any medium, we can find the current density by multiplying the conductivity to electric field. From the Ohm law, we also remember that the resistance of a conductor can be found by dividing the voltage drop on the conductor to the current passing through it. Here a cylinder with the length of L and surface area of A is shown. The resistance of this cylinder can be found by dividing the voltage drop across it to the current passing through it. We know V is equal to E times L and I is J times A. Knowing E divided by J is equal to conductivity, we find a well-known equation for calculating the electrical resistance. Similarly, in the magnetic domain, B and H are related to each other through permeability. It is common that the permeability of materials are expressed relative to the permeability of free space. For free space, the permeability is shown with mu naught and it is equal to 4 times pi times 10 to the order of minus 7. Relative permeability, denoted by mu r, is the ratio of the permeability of a specific medium to the permeability of free space. For example, when we say that the relative permeability of a material is 1000, it means that its permeability is 1000 times larger than the permeability of free space. We define a quantity equivalent to resistance in magnetic domain. The reluctance of an object is defined as the MMF drop on it divided by the total flux passing through it. Here, a cylinder with the length of L and surface area of A is shown, which a flux density of B is passing through it. We know that MMF is equal to H times L and total flux is equal to B times A. Knowing that H divided by B is called permeability, we can define reluctance as L divided by permeability times surface area. This equation is very similar to the equation that we have for calculating resistance. Only conductivity is replaced with permeability. It is the conductivity of the material which tells us if it is capable of conducting current or not. For instance, non-conducting materials such as teflon or air have a low conductivity. On the other hand, metals such as aluminum or copper have a very large value of conductivity. The same is true in magnetic domain. 
If a material has a high permeability, it is called a magnetic material. As it was mentioned before, the permeability of a material is its relative permeability times the permeability of the air. For non-magnetic materials, the relative permeability is close to 1. For magnetic materials used in power electronics, the relative permeability could be anywhere from few tens to several thousands. Unfortunately, magnetic materials exhibit saturation with increasing the field intensity. When they operate with low field intensities, mu, which is the ratio of B to H, is constant and the BH curve is linear. As the field intensity increases, the slope of BH curve reduces and permeability drops. When B is more than the saturation B, the relative permeability drops to 1 and the permeability of the material is similar to the permeability of free space. Finally, we conclude our magnetic circuit theory by introducing the equivalent of a voltage source in magnetic structures. In magnetic structures, a winding with current flowing through it acts as a voltage source in its equivalent magnetic circuit. The value of this voltage source is equal to the number of turns times to the current passing through the winding. The flux inside the coil can be found using the right hand law. The positive sign of the source shows the flux direction. By understanding the magnetic equivalent circuit, we are now ready to study inductors. One way of classifying inductors is grouping them into gapped and ungapped inductors. Let's start by the ungapped inductors. Here you can see a basic structure of an ungapped inductor. There is a magnetic core and a winding around that, and there is no discrete gap in the core. While a toroidal core is shown here, the core can be of any geometry. Let's build the equivalent circuit of this inductor and analyze it. First. We know that the winding is equivalent to a voltage source. The value of voltage source is equal to n times i. Next, we have to find the reluctance of the core. We recall that the reluctance can be calculated using this equation. We use the average radius of the ring to find the length of the core, which is equal to 2 times pi times the average of a and b, where a is the inner radius and b is the outer radius. The cross section of the core is shown here. We also need the permeability of the core to calculate the value of reluctance. Considering that we have all these values, now we can find the flux in the core. Remember, magnetic flux is equivalent to the current in electric circuits. We know that the current in such a circuit is equal to voltage divided by the equivalent resistance. So we can easily say that the magnetic flux in the core is equal to source MMF divided by the core reluctance, as shown here. Now we found the flux in the core, we introduce a new quantity called flux linkage. Flux linkage, which is shown by lambda, is the linking of the magnetic field with the inductors of a coil when the magnetic field passes through the loops of the coil. In a simpler definition, the flux linkage of a coil can be found by multiplying the flux passing through the coil to the number of turns. And finally, the inductance of a coil is defined as the flux linkage of the coil divided by the current that is generating that flux. To find the inductance then, we divide the flux linkage to the current. Replacing the corresponding terms, we can find the inductance of this inductor as the square of turns divided by the total reluctance. Now we have the relationship for the inductance of this ungapped inductor. Looking at the equation, the number of turns, mu naught, area and core length are constant. However, as explained earlier, the relative permeability mu r depends on the operating B and is nonlinear. To understand the effect of this, let's assume that the flux density in the core is small and way below the saturation flux density. This is a linear region with somehow constant and large mu r. Remember that mu is the slope of BH curve. As B increases, we are getting closer to the saturation level. As you can see, the slope of BH curve reduces, which means that mu r is dropping. This reduction continues until we hit the saturation level. After that, the relative permeability drops to 1. 
Looking at these points, we can see these inequalities. Since the value of inductance is proportional to the relative permeability of the core, we can see that the value of L drops as we get closer to the saturation level. When the core gets saturated, the value of inductance significantly drops. This nonlinearity can be problematic if we do not consider it in the design stage. To give an example, let's say that this is the current waveform that is passing through the inductor. We showed that flux and so B are directly proportional to the value of current. When the current is at its minimum, the core permeability is mu r1. Using this value, we find the inductance value corresponding to this point. When the current reaches to its maximum, B increases and gets closer to the saturation level. At this point, relative permeability is mu r2, which is less than mu r1. This mu r leads to a lower inductance value as shown here. This example shows that the inductor value changes with the current and reaches to its maximum when the current is minimum and drops to its minimum when the current is at maximum. When we design the inductor, we have to design it for the worst case and make sure that even when the inductance value drops to its minimum, its value is enough for our application. Ungapped inductors are usually made out of iron powder materials. They are usually used when the flux swing is small and the operating frequency is not very high, usually in the range of few tens of kilohertz. Compared to ferrite materials, they have a higher saturation level, typically around 1 to 1.5 tesla. This allows for the use of less turns to avoid saturation and usually leads to a more compact inductor comparing to the case when we use ferrite. For large current repairs and high switching frequencies, core loss will be significant. For these applications, gapped inductors using ferrite cores are preferred. Now let's talk about gapped inductors. Here is a simple structure for a gapped inductor. In its simplest form, it has a winding, a core, and a discrete gap. We will use our knowledge in equivalent magnetic circuits to analyze it. We start by the winding. We know its model is a voltage source with the value of n times i. Then we have the reluctance of the core. We also have an air gap which has a reluctance. The flux in the core and air gap is equivalent to the current in the circuit. To find the flux in the core, we have to divide the source MMF to the total reluctance. The source MMF is equal to n times i and the total reluctance is equal to the reluctance of the core plus the reluctance of the air gap. Now we have to find the reluctance of the core and air gap. For the core, we can take a look at the datasheet of the core and using the dimensions, we can find the core area and also the core length. We also need to know the relative permeability of the core, which we can find from the datasheet. For the air gap, the reluctance can be found by using the length of the air gap and the area of the core. Please note that the fringing of flux is not considered here. Now we have all the required quantities. We can find the flux in the core. Flux is equal to n times i divided by the total reluctance. By replacing the core and air gap reluctances with their corresponding terms, the flux in the core is found. Knowing the flux in the core, we can find the flux linkage by multiplying the number of turns to the flux. Finally, the inductance can be found by dividing the flux linkage to the current. The resulting equation for the inductor is very similar to what we found for the ungapped inductor. The only difference is that now we have an extra term in the denominator, which is the reluctance of the gap. In general, the self-inductance of a coil is defined as n square divided by the total reluctance seen by the winding. To compare the reluctance of the core and air gap, let's consider a case study. The selected core is UI302516. Looking at the datasheet, we can see that the core length is 82 mm and the cross-sectional area is 161 square millimeter. The selected material is 3C94, which is a ferrite material with a relative permeability of 2030.
The core reluctance can be calculated using the core length, cross section, and relative permeability. Replacing terms with their corresponding numbers gives us the core reluctance close to 200,000. The air gap reluctance can be found by using air gap and cross sectional area. Replacing terms with their values gives us a value close to 5 million. In reality, the air gap reluctance would be a bit smaller due to the fringing of the flux. This example clearly shows that the air gap reluctance is the dominating factor in the magnetic circuit. For practical purposes, we might neglect the core reluctance and only consider the air gap reluctance. This is a good approximation as long as the permeability of the core multiplied by the air gap length is much larger than the core length. Knowing that the air gap reluctance is much larger than the core reluctance, we ignore the core reluctance and simplify the inductance relationship as shown here. Finally, we can replace the air gap reluctance by its equivalent term and get the equation for the inductance. Looking at this equation, we can see that increasing the number of turns and cross-sectional area increases the inductance. On the other hand, increasing air gap length reduces the inductance. One advantage of gapped cores is that they have a stable value over a wide range of operating points. Let's assume that this is the current passing through the inductor. When the current is at its minimum, the relative permeability is mu r1. Under this condition, the inductance value is equal to n squared divided by the reluctance of the core plus reluctance of the gap. Please note that here, the core reluctance is not neglected for this analysis. When the current is maximum, the core permeability reduces to mu r2, and so the core reluctance increases. This causes the inductance value to drop. Nevertheless, if we are operating below saturation level, in both cases, the air gap reluctance still dominates and the inductor value is equal to n squared divided by the air gap reluctance. So the inductance value will not get affected by the change in core permeability. To master the analysis of inductors, here is another example using an EE core. This sort of geometry is more common than U cores, which was considered before. Let's consider that we have air gap in all legs and we want to find the equivalent inductor. For the sake of simplicity, the core reluctance is ignored as its value is much lower than air gaps. The equivalent circuit is shown here. We have a reluctance in center post and two equal reluctances on the side legs. The flux in center post is twice the flux passing through sides. The reluctance of side legs are twice the reluctance of center post, as the cross section on the side legs is half of the center post. The equivalent circuit can be simplified by combining two side reluctances as they are connected in parallel. The equivalent is the reluctance equal to half of each side reluctances. This reluctance then is in series with the reluctance of the center post, making the total reluctance equal to twice of the center post reluctance. Knowing that the inductance value is equal to n squared divided by the equivalent reluctance, we can find the value of inductance as shown here. These three examples showed us how to analyze inductor structures. We learned that the inductance can be found by dividing the n square to the equivalent reluctance seen by in the binding. The previous analyses were based on the assumption that we are working below saturation and so the permeability of the core is high. To see what happens when the core gets saturated, let's simplify the nonlinear pH curve. Two regions of operation is considered here. When B is less than the saturation level, we assume the relative permeability of the core is constant and equal to mu r, which is much higher than 1. As shown earlier, the inductance value is equal to n squared divided by the sum of core reluctance and air gap reluctance. Since mu r is a large value, the core reluctance is small and the total reluctance is determined mostly by the air gap. So we can find the inductance by dividing n square to the air gap reluctance. However, when B is more than the saturation flux density, mu r drops to 1. Since mu r now is 1, the reluctance of the core will be very large. 
As a result, the inductance value sharply drops from the intended inductance value to a very small value, and the operation of the circuit will be interrupted. To understand what the effect of core saturation on the circuit is, let's assume a simple case where an inductor is connected to a voltage source. The current in the inductor is equal to V divided by the impedance of inductor. When the core gets saturated, the value of inductor drops to a small value. This causes the current to significantly increase. So the symptom of core saturation is the large current generation. One important criteria in inductor design is to avoid saturation under all circumstances. To do so, the maximum operating flux density should be less than the saturation flux density. We remember that the flux and current were related through the inductance definition. Based on the relationship, we see that the flux density inside the core is equal to L times current divided by N times A. Since the flux density is directly proportional to the current, maximum flux density happens at the peak current. To avoid saturation, this maximum flux density should be less than the saturation flux density. When we design the inductor, the value of L and the peak current are known values. So basically, nominator is fixed. Looking at this formula, we can see that we have two parameters in the denominator to play with. We can increase the number of turns, or we can use a larger core with a bigger surface area to limit the flux density. Doing both is unfavorable, as it increases the size and loss. So we really want to select our Bmax as close as possible to B saturation. If we increase the number of turns, the winding resistance increases as the length of the wire has increased. Increasing number of turns also may lead to an unreasonably large gap which causes fringing loss. On the other hand, increasing cross-sectional area means using a larger core, which increases the size. For the same flux density, larger core also means a larger core loss. In order to design an optimal inductor for our application, we have two main equations to satisfy. First, we need a certain value of inductance. As we showed earlier, the inductance value is mostly determined by the air gap and can be found using this equation. Second, we also have to make sure that the core does not get saturated. This means the peak flux density should be less than saturation flux density. We might also have other specifications regarding the winding resistance or core loss. Optimal design of magnetics is an iterative process and means picking an optimal core, a proper core material, an optimal number of turns, air gap length, and wire size. After finishing the design, we have to check if the design satisfies our requirement. For instance, we have to check if we get the required DCR or if the core loss is acceptable. In this video, we learn basic magnetic theory and the principles of inductors. In the next video, I will talk about the inductor design and present an example. Thank you, Ali, for introducing this very interesting topic. If you have interest in power electronics, please uh, visit our channel.